You're listening to Let Me Tell You Why You're Wrong, all on Georgia Radio Network. Welcome to episode 62 of the Let Me Tell You Why You're Wrong podcast. I'm Dave Roberts. With me is Jessica Salaji. Hello. And Matt Lowe has been suspended for breaking the bleep button for his last <laughs> fuck you, Dave. See? And there it is. Jessica, how's your week? My week has been good. How's your week been? I do love spring. Is it spring? It feels like summer here. It's 90. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. I mean, I love the warm weather, but we had like two days of spring, a tornado, and now it's summer. (laughs) That's South Georgia for you. Well, you know, with the rest of the state, it gets so beautiful you want to open your windows, but there's so much pollen in the air you can't. You know, I was thinking about this, and I I was going to save it for my closing thought, but since you brought it up, like talking about pollen, I feel like every year people are like, oh, it's the worst it's ever been. No, like we just live in this hellhole with all this pollen every year, and it's just miserable every time it comes. But it's not any worse than it was the year before. Just live in this green mess. Oh, I think as we get older, it affects us worse and worse, or... Maybe just everybody's a drama queen now. Right. And no, I've, I've, I think the media totally hypes it up. I mean, having it like on rotation in the morning as you're getting ready to go to work. And it's like, the count is 15 million today. Better wear a mask. Yeah. Now, I remember some years where the pollen was so bad it felt like snow. Mm-hmm. Like you would you would legitimately leave. I sound like Matt now. Legitimately leave. Uh, you would leave footprints walking in the driveway. Yeah. I mean, I remember that. And my cat would always come in the house with, like, green paws and everything. And I do prefer the warm weather over winter, so I won't complain. Even if we can't <laughs> breathe. And you won't. I won't. Okay, the last episode was sponsored by the letters F and U. <laughs> yes. It was. Um, we got, we have an update on Peachtree City. Peachtree City voted to deny the motion to give the city the authority to pay for the legal fees of council members and city employees who sue citizens over um, disputes on social media and in the news and whatnot. Um, there were it was a beautiful thing. They live streamed it. It's still on Facebook if you want to see it on their local newspaper, which is the Citizen. But they had. Like hundreds of people show up to oppose it and to speak. Um, They had two hours of testimony. People were given two minutes each, and they had two hours of people just one after the next telling them why they opposed it. Everyone from college kids to the ACLU to Americans for Prosperity um, to people in the military who were there, like in their uniforms and everything. I mean, people showed out. Not a single person spoke in in favor of it. And it was so bad that no one would even admit who was responsible for it. So we still don't know. Although I know a lot of media outlets are filing open records requests to get the memos and the emails related to it. But all these people were there. They all spoke. The council was embarrassed. The city attorney was there. They cleared the room out to go into executive session. And when they came out of executive session, most everyone was gone. And they announced that they had voted to use city funds to wage a joint lawsuit against a citizen who had accused them of violating the Georgia meetings, the open meetings act. Um, So they didn't make it their ordinance. They didn't pass the resolution, but they went ahead and went into executive session to vote on a single instance in which they're planning to sue a citizen. So bravo Peachtree city. You're still the worst. And this little podcast got shared by, uh, Sharpsburg. Sharpsburg. Yes. <laughs> and I would like to tell, you know, the city of Sharpsburg, 
There are three people in this podcast, not just Jessica. <laughs> That's true. There are. And we but couldn't do it without Dave because Dave hosts and neither Matt nor I are organized enough to host. So. Oh, no, you're plenty organized. You don't want to do it. That's true. Matt can't. <laughs> Matt, when he gets on the gets on to record, literally is opening the uh, <laughs> the outline as he's looking at it. Uh, as Matt. bad as I sound on this podcast, I actually read ahead and try to make sure I can pronounce most of the words. <laughs> you Google blight <laughs> before you have to talk about it. <laughs> no, actually, blight I knew. Right. I can't remember what word it was last week or week before. Just I just murdered, and you guys are like, you guys didn't even help. You're like, I'm going to leave you out on that one. Yeah. Sometimes you just got to let them drown. <laughs> they'll, they'll float back up. <laughs> but back, but on Peachtree City, I mean, I think it was a win overall. And at least with the single instance, like, on, it's not just a blanket ordinance to give them a free-for-all. And they'll at least have to legally... They did vote legally. It's just a unconstitutional vote. And I'm sure they're going to end up losing. But... Um, yeah, good old Peachtree City. But I loved that that many people showed up. It made my heart go pitter patter. I'm not sure who it didn't offend. I mean, you've got R's, D's, L's, I's all show up going, yeah, you can't do that. Well, and, you know, the ACLU, one of the representatives, their field director spoke. And he's like, look at this room. He's like, when was the last time you saw these people of all these demographics, of all these political leanings, of all of these belief systems standing united on an issue? Like, does that send you a message or what? And he's right. I mean, free speech almost always unites people unless you get into something like kneeling or burning a flag. Then, of course, it's political again. But these types of things, when it's government against the people, you don't stand a chance. Thank God right. for that. It was six people sitting behind a desk saying, "Hey, we're gonna we have special treatment privileges, and and we don't have to spend our own money to sue you." I love it. I mean, can you imagine how humiliating that would be to sit there for two hours while people had like driven from all around the state <laughs> to tell you how wrong you are? No, the the guy that was almost coming to tears uh, on the on the on the board saying about how this is a volunteer thing. And and uh, basically, he decided, he decided he was going to crawl up on the cross and, and martyr himself about how hard of a job it is to be this, this city council. Just, I wanted to hold his head into a toilet. <laughs> I really did. I mean, you, you turd. I you, know. Ra you ran for that office. You ran from the... I mean, you, you asked, asked people yes. to vote for you. And most likely against somebody else. Like somebody else said, hey, I'll do it. And you're like, no, I'll be better at it. And then you want to stand up there and, and cry and talk about how hard of a job it is to, to run this little tiny city. This is totally irrelevant, but what you were talking about, like asking for it and wanting it so bad and thinking that you're better than everyone else. Listen to this. There's, a, there's something going on in Bryan County, which I'll be talking about over the next coming weeks. But there is a city in Bryan County where currently only the mayor and one councilman were actually elected and everyone else has been run off and they reappointed everyone. So the mayor and one council member have pretty much stacked the deck for everything. Isn't that fascinating? Like they basically staged a coup and put in their own government against the will of the people. So do you need a... Uh... A telephone booth, or do you just go ahead and change it home and put on the cape and and and, uh, and tights and fly there? <laughs> I would love to have some sort of thing, even if it was just a jetpack, to let me fly. But the lady was like, I, not this lady, but a different one today. She called me about something that's going on with her county, and she's like, the the government official told me that if I wanted to deal with it, I needed to get a lawyer. She's like, I figured I would just ask you instead I'm like well i'm not a lawyer but i'm pretty mouthy so what do you got pretty mouthy yeah it's, it's, it's you you and eric like batman and robin 
<laughs> and Eric's meanwhile, Eric's like, we're gonna be we're gonna be this car's gonna be found on the side of the road. Please just just drive. Just go. Just get out of this county. He really is gonna be collateral damage one day. <laughs> Poor Eric. When the drone strike comes. <laughs> <laughs> it's always the tech guy. <laughs> well, speaking of not a lawyer. <laughs> right. Kim Kardashian says you shouldn't have to go to law school to be a lawyer. Okay. This story was my idea. I never thought we would be talking about Kim Kardashian on our podcast. But if you actually think about her point, which we're going to kind of elaborate on, it's it's kind of legit. Oh, sure. It's a question of can you do the job? Right. So her argument is that you should be able to study, pass the bar, and practice law without having to go to school because they require you to go to school. And I think there are a couple states, California, Virginia, Vermont, and Washington. I didn't know that there were even any states left that allowed you to work as an apprentice instead of going to law school. Um, But... I mean, I think every single one of us can acknowledge we learned more working than we ever did in school, unless maybe you're in, like a doctor. Well, and she's not, I mean, yeah, she's Kim Kardashian, but she's not completely ignorant in, in the law. Uh, her father was on OJ's defense team. Right. Uh, and I'm not, I can't believe I said anything loving about Kim Kardashian. Um. Other than she's a money-making machine. Uh, she's smart. Not how I would do it, but she did it. <laughs> really? Not the, <laughs> you wouldn't start your career off with, 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 a, with a sex tape? No. It would have been hard to transition back to politics from that, but... Apparently not. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's taken her a while. It's been a good decade. I mean, she had to pay her dues. And she wasn't even a star on the of that. E-Channel. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, God. <laughs> but back, 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 oh, God. Back to the, to the, uh, to the, to the principle. I really don't care what your credentials are if you can do the job. Well, and especially with the law, I mean, you, you are constantly referencing books and, code sections and legal precedents and case law and you're researching. I mean, it's not a memory based industry. It's, it's always changing too. So I don't have a problem with lawyers not having to go to law school. I mean, I don't know. I don't understand how it's any different than reporting on the law. You reference what you're, I mean, there's certain concepts I'm sure that are important I took a few philosophy classes and they were a nightmare. But well, it, it, and we say the law as if it's one thing. You have corporate attorneys, which probably need to have a little more specialized training. Now, I'm not saying that, that there should be a government regulation, but if you're going to handle corporate contracts, you're going to need to be more studied in that area. You know, we all kind of think of criminal defense, but there are so many facets of the law that aren't being a litigator a real estate attorney a guy that does you know closings he probably doesn't need to know every bit of case law when it comes to uh, constitutional practice his job is to make sure that the contracts are clean between a buyer and a seller in real estate well and it kind of presents a bigger question I think when when you're talking about well you know you have they say you have to go to law school which is three years and that's the prerequisite to even take the test to become a lawyer like all of our education from beginning to end but especially in higher education is simply because somebody said this is sufficient somebody sometime said this is enough to do the job in the industry and nine times out of ten, it's not. Well, that's the thing, is you spend three years in law school after four years of undergrad, and then you come out, and what are you? Nothing. You're and an I, apprentice. 
And most most law schools won't let you work in law school. Like you can't have, you know, a full time job or like. It, it's just an interesting. It's an interesting conundrum that I think. You know, if we're all going to sit around and say you don't have to go to college to be successful in life and we value trade schools and we value work experience and the real world is where you learn how to do things. That's how you learn your skills. That's how you learn your trades. That's how you refine everything. Then there has to be some validity to her point. It just sucks that she's the messenger because people don't want to listen because they see her as Kim Kardashian. And all of her at that. Correct. Yeah, well, that's that's the thing is, even in, and I know, I, I, I'm not a lawyer, I'm a simple AC guy, but if I have two guys that come to apply for a job, one guy says, I just got out of tech school, somebody says, I've been working as an apprentice for three years, hey, give me the apprentice. Yeah. Give me the guy that's actually been doing it, not learning theory. And, and I know this goes back in our in our history a little bit, but Lincoln, your favorite, did not go to law school. It shows John, he suspended habeas corpus. But anyway, carry on. John Quincy Adams, Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson was not exactly the <laughs> the uh, best on human rights either, or civil rights. But, and I know that was a different time. The medical schools weren't the same at that time. You know, you're talking about 19th century uh early 19th century with, with those guys. I would rather have somebody who studied under someone who's, who's very, very good rather than somebody who spent three years going to law school, racking up tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars with a debt. That's to come out and immediately start making, making money. And how is he going to make that money? Well, and especially I don't, this is a topic we're going to talk about, so I don't want to transition if we're not ready. But like when we're having this conversation about student debt, I'm a firm believer that if you want to invest in yourself, you should. And part of making a value, a good investment in yourself is, you know, doing something that you know you can get a return on that investment. I mean, I'm not going to go do, I, I don't, I'm not going to invest, waste time on money. For myself that's not going to benefit me in the long run but if you can do better by actually doing it and then you're better off financially and you're a you know a taxpayer and investing in the economy and doing and doing life i don't it's just an interesting conversation to have i would like to know like i don't even know how you measure this it's not like you could look at bar complaints or something because these states are are varying, various, varying, excuse me, in population and I'm sure demographics and so many other things. But it would be interesting to know how many in those four states have actually become lawyers through the apprentice program instead of through school. Probably a few, because look, <clears throat> the free market's still the free market. If you go to Stanford Law, if you go to Harvard Law, your resume still reads different from somebody who says, I studied under so-and-so. So there's still a value, especially when you get into higher-end uh, corporate law, that your resume speaks for itself. But I think we've gotten to a point in this country where we value the classroom over, over experience. Right. And it's... I don't know how we get back... And I don't think we ever can. When you go to apply for a job in corporate America, you put your information onto a website now. It goes into an algorithm. And it just goes, okay, uh, education, you start, start clicking things and filters just start filtering you out. Where it used to be, and I know I'm a decade older than you are, you went in and you would talk to somebody who's hiring and they say, okay, I'll give you a shot. You're actually 12 years older than me, I think. Shut up. But you did give us our premature transition. Elizabeth Warren has a one and a quarter trillion, 
with a T. Plan to pay off student loan debt. Should she become POTUS? When this story first came out last week, they first said it was $640 billion to cancel the debt. And then they kind of went on with the whole plan and it's over a trillion dollars. And there are people who think that some element of this is a good idea. I, I, I can't comprehend it. Like, I, I, don't, I don't even know where to start. What aspect of this do you want to start on? Well, it was actually kind of what you put on your Facebook that had me bringing this up. I, mean, I was aware of it, but that you paid for your education and you made your choices and and you accept responsibility for the loans you took. Right. And look, I've seen people use student loans to buy cars, sure. pay bills, do all sorts of ill-advised things with that money because it, it was all free. It didn't, didn't cost them anything. In fact, I believe CRA, the Community Reinvestment Act, prohibits banks from counting deferred student loans into debt-to-income ratios when they make loans. So the whole student loan process, I didn't have them for undergrad. I just got them for graduate school. So I was 22 when I applied for them. So, you know, a few years wiser. I'd been out on my own for a couple of years and I was definitely like paying my own way. And my graduate tuition, I want to say, I'm, this, uh, this is terrible. I don't even remember how much it was, but I want to say it was between like six and seven thousand dollars a semester. And I was approved for eleven thousand eight hundred dollars every semester, well beyond what I needed. Plus, I was a bit like you could also get these sub like secondary loans that, um, I guess are divided into a separate group or something. I don't know, but I mean. There was no question. They knew how much my tuition was. They paid it directly to the school. And there was no connection between how much I needed versus how much um, I was I was offered. And on top of that, you know, I, I fell right in that window when they doubled, Obama doubled the interest rate. So I was very conscious of the fact that, like, the whole time, I, you don't accrue any interest while you're in school. But then... A year after you graduate, all of a sudden, you've got this mega interest payment. So I paid interest the whole time I was in school, even if it was just a little bit. But I went to school with people who took out the max that they were given, and they ended up with double the student loans that I was. Well, when I was when I came out of school, I was already they just add the interest on the like on the top of the loan. I was already like twelve thousand dollars in interest more than what I took out. Can you imagine if? You took out double what you needed, what the interest would be. And, you know, I think I've told the story on the podcast before. I was at a young man's house who was about to graduate from life. Uh, he wasn't dying. He wasn't graduating from mm -hmm. life, life university. And he was going to be a chiropractor. And he had racked up, I think it was 80000 in debt. I mean, he bought a motorcycle with it and everything else. And I, and I said, I said, son... How much do you make for cracking a back? He's like, well, you know, by the time you do everything, it's about forty bucks. I said, how many backs do you have to crack to make back eighty thousand plus interest? Oh, right. You know, I don't know, but it, you're right. It's a personal decision. When we bought the house that I'm in now, we were approved for way more, mm -hmm. and it was one of those things where the the bank or the mortgage lender sent over the approval. I'm like, are you stupid? I wouldn't lend me this much. Well, and you know, it's at 22, you had the maturity to say, look, I don't need it. And you're also pro probably smarter than the average bear to say, yeah, this. You well, I'd already, I mean, like I said, I'd already been paying my own bills and they tell you, they give you like an estimated what your payment will be when you come out and you're, you know, <laughs> you like plug the number in and you're like, holy crap. Okay. Uh, what if I only take out this much? Um, but what you're talking about with the how, I mean, it's like a, the student loan debt is the easiest to obtain by anyone. And I'll, I'm going to bring up a story 
in a second, but as a nation, we praise debt. We tell people to overextend themselves. I mean, I got a credit card when I was 18 and my limit was $500. And I've now had the card for 12 years. Not once has the bank asked me how much money I make. And the credit card limit is more than I should ever, that anyone should ever have on a credit card limit. And for what? And they have no idea how much money I make if I'm capable of paying it back. If I had it all the way maxed out, I would not be capable of paying it back. And that's just where we are as a society. The difference with the loans is that everyone's walking around thinking that, you know, it sh college should be cheaper, it should be free, the loan should be forgiven, and therefore take out as much as you want because we'll fix it on the back end. Well, and you know, the the biggest thing with that is if you want to borrow money to go to college, that's on you. Get the government out of it. There shouldn't be any government-backed student loans. Right. Totally agree. The, the banks are secure in doing this because they know no matter what happens, they're made whole. The government will make them whole. So there's really no risk. Now, now if they don't meet certain credit criteria, that's one thing. But what 18-year-old has negative credit? Right. So if you, get, if you remove government from that private transactions, you would see banks get tighter than a frog's rear end. And say, what's it's, your major? What do you want to do with this? Yeah. Not, are you in school? Right. I mean, they will give student loans for going to beauty college for, they will give student loans for anything. Uh, I, I want to, you know, study lesbian uh, uh, literature in the 17th century. Well, okay. Well, here's a hundred grand. Go to school, kid. Right. Well, and I mean... I, this probably isn't a fair, this is why government shouldn't be involved, because I don't think government should make this decision. It should be a private lender deciding. But there are certain things, like you mentioned, with trades and skills and certain certificates that you could pay as you go. You should pay as you go. You don't have to. It's not like when you're a doctor where you can like take a, you can't go a semester and work a semester and alternate. When you're trying to go get a, another type of certificate, you can do that. And that should be taken into account, too, if if it needs to be completed because you need a lump sum. I mean, there was a woman that commented on my post about this, and she said that she took out loans for her daughter. She was a supporter of forgiveness, and she only her only income was Social Security, and her argument was, well... Why is it my problem? They knew that's the only income I had. They gave it to me. Y you didn't have to take it. I mean, <laughs> nobody held a gun to anyone's head and said, you absolutely have to take out a student loan. And, and they're very thorough. I mean, I'm not like, they make you go through a PowerPoint and sign off on all these things. They, they're, you're constantly getting harassed like every semester through the entire process i mean it's it's over the top of information if you're paying attention and you're you're prepared i knew when i took out my loan that it was going to be 504 dollars and 33 cents once i graduated they told me that so i planned for yeah it. <laughs> for the rest of your life well no i'm almost done because i've made well no i'm just talking about at 22 years sure. old to say the next 15 years is, is perceivably the rest of your life, I mean, forever. Right. And the thing that's most frustrating about this and is is not a part of the conversation is that your payback time is 10 years for gener like for if you're not going to have a Harvard loan or in medical schools or vet or something. It's 10 years. If you get into financial problems, if you lose your job, you can defer your payments. You can have them based on your income. You can, they will restructure your loan to help you. You can have it balloon so that when you first graduate, you pay, you know, $100 a month and the next year you pay 200 and it goes up and up and up. Like they already have plans in place to help people who hit a bump or the economy in their area might not be what they thought it was or like we have solutions already in place. This is, this is a nightmare and it makes me furious 
What? There's no other debt in life that is forgivable. Right. No, absolutely. It, look, even with, with doctors, if you, if you remove student loans, at least the government-backed student loans, you have doctors that used to become indentured servants. They would agree to go to whatever community for a certain period of time if they would pay for the law school. Or medical, going back to the previous story, uh, their medical school is you're going to be our town's doctor and we're going to pay for your schooling. There's ways to, to get yourself through even the most expensive education. But all that's been removed because it's now perceivably free. Well, and government created this problem and they think government can solve it. And people were citing, you know, oh, well, if, you know, we bailed out GM and the banks and all that, we should, why not the people? We bailed out big companies. Okay, well, are you? ticked about how that all went down and aren't you ticked about the aftermath and aren't you ticked about there being sacred cows by the by the government like let's be consistent here folks it also doesn't help the banks any the banks make 15 year investments four while you're in school and 10 they're after pay for it is they have business projections on getting paid back over that time you're going to tell all of them that, hey, we're just, the government's going to swoop in and pay them all off, pay them all, all off early and screw up, you know, your books on that stuff. It's one thing if, if 100 people pay their loans off early, not a big deal. If they all do, after they've taken capital and paid to borrow that money, that's when they pay interest on your CDs and all that stuff, that's the bank borrowing money from you to lend to somebody else and they get paid early without a penalty because the government just comes in and says, hey, here's your money back. Everybody, nobody feels sorry for the banks until they own bank stock and they see their bank start, you know, their stock take a hit. Uh, I, you and I would probably agree we're having the wrong conversation about how crippling student loan debt is. Like we're talking about it from the economy side. These people are talking about it from a lack of personal responsibility side. But it's even more frustrating that the one of the biggest threats to our country, which is this balloon that is this bubble that is going to burst. And we only talk about it every four years when we're, we have candidates trying to get votes. I mean, this has been a growing problem. These people have been living with this debt, choosing not to pay it back for years and taking out loans at unprecedented rates while, by the way, government institutions are driving up the cost and voting to increase the cost of tuitions like the state of Georgia just did last week. I mean, but we only talk about it when somebody wants to pander and get people on the hook because they know that a dependent people is a easy to manipulate people. Yeah, no one actually does a thing about the national debt. And adding one and a quarter trillion, and I've seen estimates on her plan go up to one and a half and beyond. And you think, well, what's the difference between a quarter and a half? Well, a lot. When you start talking about a trillion, you're talking about an additional 200, estimates going up to another additional 250 billion to make it a one and a half trillion. These numbers are staggering. And I think what does us a disservice is summing it up in such a small word, trillion, instead of writing the zeros out. Because people don't have a concept of how much most people don't have a concept of what a million dollars is. Mm -hmm. And then to, to take that in perspective and then extrapolate that out to one and a quarter trillion. And this is, th these are things that the, these are decisions that individuals made, uh, private contracts that are backed by the government. And now, now we're going to say that there are no repercussions to your contracts that you sign. That's, well, let's get on to more cheery news. Ugh. The Sixth Circuit tells parking enforcement officers to shove the chalk. For years, and as long as I can remember, especially parking at the airport, back when you could actually park like in front of the airport and walk in and meet, meet somebody, if it was 15-minute parking, an officer would come and chalk your tire. And then they, they would look at their watch and go back and go, okay, well, it's been more than 15 minutes, write them a ticket. The high court on a case in Michigan has decided that is unconstitutional. 
You think this will go higher, or you think this will be the? Uh, I. I don't see either side spending the money to take it higher. Right. And the, the time is already limited for SCOTUS. Man, I really would hate to see the bandwidth of the Supreme Court being taken up with parking chalk. So my question for you is when you when you heard this, I don't know if you knew that the courts were contemplating this or what, or if this I had not heard about this before the article came out. But when you heard it, were you like, yeah, I, knew, I, I felt like chalk, mark, chalking tires was a violation of, was it the Fourth Amendment? I think, yeah, Fourth Amendment. Yeah. Did you, did you, was that, are you, it was constituted as an unreasonable search. Did you, when you've heard of tire marking, did you feel like that was equated to that? It never occurred to me. Me either. And and I was aware of the practice. I mean, going back to being a being a kid, uh, I was aware of the practice, but it never occurred to me that it would be unconstitutional to do that. Now, look, there are plenty of other ways that they can mark your car now. In fact, Jessica and I are probably on so many watch lists, they know exactly where we are for how long. Yeah. Ding, 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 ding. But this, so the reason I asked you that is because there's a police force um, that will, in the metro area, that will mark tires of people at bars and restaurants and then pull them over later for a DUI and say, well, you know, where are you coming from or whatever. Like, they, they would mark people who went into certain places when they parked in downtown areas. So, but I... You, you know, you can stare at them and be like, that's terrible. Why would you do that? That doesn't seem right. But I would have never, I guess I just didn't think of it in an analytical way to say well, that's an unreasonable search. But I guess you're tracking them. I mean, it's interesting. It's a very creative. Now, does it open the door? For? To license plate scanners. If you sit outside a bar... And you take pictures of all, I say take pictures, whatever, scan license plates, and then just wait for those license plates to leave the bar. Is that the same thing? That's a digital version of barking with chalk. Hmm. Um, well, they, so this article on NBC that we are referencing said that, you know, they said it's trespassing, not law enforcement. Is it different when they don't actually touch your car? Well, we say that technology does not change rights. Okay, so does it change because you're not issuing parking tickets, but you're dealing with... I mean, I would argue that an unlicensed tag or an unregistered tag or an expired license is the equivalent of a parking ticket because it's administrative. If it's somebody... If you're searching for a car because... And you ping a warrant or something, then that's obviously law enforcement. So I guess it depends on what it, like, I feel like the discrepancy would come up on what you're using it for. Even if you're paying a warrant, that is somebody who owns that vehicle, not not necessarily driving or occupying that vehicle. Sure. So in the example that you used on looking for DUIs, you know, people leaving this bar. So is that a fourth amendment violation? Probably. So it ended up in the court of appeals because of, a district judge in Michigan dismissed the the original suit saying that even if chalking a tire is a search, it's a reasonable one because a piece of chalk isn't an information gathering device. Well, first of all, no, it's not a device. It's an information. It's a, I mean, but you're still identifying someone. You're still collecting information because when you come back around, you've collected the information that you left. Well, it's right. a tool. So, but that's an interesting premise. That wouldn't be, a, that wouldn't have been the reason that I would have thought it would have been dismissed. Yeah, I would have thought it being a search myself. But it, it is, it is interesting. And anytime that 
we reel in frivolous things like parking tickets. I'm generally for it. Just I, I'm wondering how this this decision will be applied elsewhere. I in limiting limiting uh, law enforcement. I do love or, that in a three year period, this woman had her tire. The one that took it to the court of appeals had her tires chalked fifteen times on fifteen different occasions. Like. It's of course it's that woman that's taking it to the courts all the way up. I love it. Yeah, I mean this is the this is what every citizen threatens to do. I'll take it all the way to the Supreme Court. Well, right. this one did. It actually moved pretty quickly. I mean, up to the Court of Appeals if if it happened between 2017, but that was the last one, but um the city or the enforcement, they argued that they had a community caretaker exception, which is interesting okay. for especially for parking violations. I mean, there's no there's no danger to the public if you overstay your your slot. One wouldn't think so. It's I mean it's it's a parking spot. It's not a fire zone. It's a parking spot. I equate the people who check parking meters and parking apps to the TSA. Like I just, they're at the bottom of my totem pole for sure. Little, very little respect if that's what you, I mean, I'm glad you have a job, but come on now. Okay. <laughs> yeah, glad you have a job, but your job should, shouldn't suck right. for everybody else I mean, around I can say you. that about your Me. zoning appeals board too, but I mean, whatever, I won't. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to say, you meter-made SOB. <laughs> I don't think... I mean, there are there municipalities that were getting on to the... Uh, uh, I can't remember what they were called, but it was the folks that would go from meter to meter dropping quarters in if they were getting close. Because the cities were getting upset that they were losing that mm-hmm. revenue. Of course, nowadays, that's outdated because you don't even put change into a meter anymore. I know. I do love that you can use an app. I love it, but it's getting more and more expensive. I paid $15 for a parking spot at the Capitol. Yeah, and had to put your tag on file. Yes, and yes, I'm currently, I've mentioned it before, I'm still in my dispute with the city of Atlanta over that, but I will keep fighting it. I actually won a parking dispute with the city of Atlanta. Did you? What mm-hmm. was your defense? Someone had set up a uh, a parking lot. It was a scam. Mm-hmm. It was de- and and they were collecting money and giving people a little, uh, uh, telling people where to park and pulling them in and parking and taking their money. And since it, again, I, it didn't even get get to court. I just told them what happened, and they're like, "Yeah, whatever. Here, it's done." But yeah, they they weren't there maintaining the lots. They just came by, took a picture of my tag, and mailed me a, a ticket. After someone had said, they allowed, I'd say they allowed, but they weren't there maintaining their own lot. And someone directed me into a space, just like you go to any baseball or football game. Someone pulls me into a lot, directs me, takes my money, gives me change, and then they then I get, get a ticket. It's a good scam, though. Sure. I mean, if you're going to, you know, steal from people, it's a pretty good way to do it. Right. Well, the Georgia Ethics Commission voted to increase political donation limits. So I guess I'm a terrible writer, blogger, hellraiser, because I thought, I did not know that the Ethics Commission was, could just, through a vote, change these things. I thought the legislature had, but actually the legislature a few years ago granted them the authority to adjust for inflation. They just can't go down. But I did not know that. Did you know that? I did not. Had it even occurred to me? Well, you just, I, I mean, you're wrong. You don't, you're not supposed to assume, but I mean, you would assume that our lawmakers are responsible for this kind of crap too. Well, no. They, of course, would, would punt on this one. That way, they can't get cited in a campaign mailer saying that they increased the amount they could collect from their friends. Sure. Look, and and you know, 
Again, I'm an air conditioning guy. The EPA was given sweeping, wide sweeping authorization to do things like fine, change refrigerants, and do all this other stuff without ever having to go back to Congress for that for that permission, which is another conversation completely with those sort of problems where the the legislative and executive branches just just totally punt their responsibility and go, okay, we're going to give it to this to this uh, this agency with appointed people, not elected officials on it. Man, I and I think you and I are in agreement on this. I'm totally cool with removing donation limits. Yeah. I mean, it's one of those things like if they're going to show you who you are, they are let them. Like let them show you who they're accountable to. Yeah, and I referred to McCain-Feingold as the Incumbent Protection mm-hmm. Act. Uh, of course, that McCain-Feingold applies to uh, national races, but it limited how much a challenger could raise. But an incumbent can get on TV any day he wants, just by holding a press conference. So McCain-Feingold was a you know, bipartisan piece of crap bill. So. I think we did a terrible job of talking about how much they actually raised them. Uh, not only did I <laughs> did we do a terrible job, I failed as host. Go well, ahead. So the limits for statewide and legislative races were, or I'm sorry, for legislative races were 2,600. Um, they raised them to 2,800 for the primary and then again in the general and then they raised the runoff cap to fifteen hundred dollars. I believe it was thirteen hundred dollars um, for a runoff for the statewide races, like our constitutional offices and public service commission and all of that. They're currently capped at sixty six hundred for a primary, um, thirty nine hundred for a primary runoff, and sixty six for the general election. Which is a lot of money. I mean, that's a, that's that's a bunch for. Yeah, that's a bunch of money. The new rule would raise the primary and general election caps to seven thousand, uh, and the primary runoff to forty one hundred. So four hundred on the primary and the general, and another two hundred on the primary runoff. So if I'm running for I don't know state senate, you could give me seven thousand. Well, this is statewide. If I'm running for a secretary of state, you can give me 7000 And then if I get caught in a runoff with another Republican, you can give me another 4100 Then if I win that runoff, you give me another 7000 after that. if there's a runoff again, like there was in the governor's race several years ago, you can give another 4100 for a total of $18,100. Now, like we said, I support uh, no caps. Like, I don't think it's, to me, it's speech. If you want to haul your money into that, I just can't comprehend. I have I I have a few elected official friends, but I don't like them enough to pour twenty grand into their coffers. Like it's that's hard for me to comprehend. But people did it, especially for Casey Cagle. I mean, he had to issue all kinds of refunds when he lost because people had maxed out to him early on and given this the full seventeen thousand. But it's a lot. I mean, that's a lot of money. But if that's what people want to do. But the argument is not really about the individuals as much as it is about the organizations. Most people oppose, you know, someone an $18,000 donation from an association or something. Look, as long as the information is public, and it is, right? I don't care. If you take a hundred grand from, I don't know. Uh, the Society for Murdering Babies. I don't care. Right. At least that needs to be up front where someone could go, well, where's his funding coming from? And you could point to it. You will never get the money out of politics. What we got with McCain-Feingold is the rise of the 5013C, which is an ungoverned, which is fine, quote-unquote nonprofit that could run whatever ads they wanted to. And this is, again, on national politics. So that's where we got swift vote veterans for Bush. This is where we get uh, the ads were we're coming back into election season soon. Uh, this had has not been endorsed by any candidate or organization. 
that stuff. So it it didn't move. It didn't remove money from politics. Right. It moved it. Yeah, I think it is a form of political speech. Totally. To give money to your to your candidate. Absolutely. And w- and w- when I gave money to my state rep. Well, I, I put it on put it on Facebook and everything else. I was proud of doing it and, and endorsing them, but it is a form of endorsement. Uh, you know, I could say that I support Jessica for governor all day long, but when I go and put you know myself down as as a contributor, that shows that I'm willing to stake my money on her becoming governor. Well, and just you, you can correct me if I'm wrong. This is per entity, right? Right. That can donate. So let's just let's just change it to ten thousand for easy math. I can donate ten thousand. Doctor Cool, my company can donate ten thousand. Connie, my wife, can right. donate ten thousand. Then if I had kids, no matter how young, they could each donate ten thousand. So there, there's ways of gaming that. And system they already anyway. do that. I mean, you will see, you'll see, of course, like corporate entities where eleven or twelve people from a company all donate the same amount of money. In like the same couple of days, there's there's a reason for that. You can't legislate well, this kind of stuff to to what we all dream of as a utopia. You just won't. You never like the more you try to regulate it, the the harder they're going to work to get around it. And if you've got, you will find if you look at any politician, I say any, if, if you look at a, a, a decent number of them, you'll find people that don't have a pot to piss in donating the max well why is that that's because somebody who wanted to donate more walked up and said this is from you right and then then you get the PAC money the 5013c the political action committee so i can i can donate to your campaign my company can my wife can my kids can i uh, will have to figure out a way to get the dogs to donate the cats don't care uh and then i can go and form a PAC, a political action committee and still run ads for you and against your opponent with unlimited spending. So all these laws did was make people feel good about themselves, make lawmakers think they look good to the voters by saying, look, we, we capped how much you can spend. We're getting the money out of politics. Thur, thur, thur. I mean, I hate to admit it with as cynical as I am about and wanting reform, but... It, it just is politics. Like, money is politics in our system. And it just is. Like, it's just something you do. You just deal with it. You just do. And there are plenty of states that don't cap it. So it's not like it's a radical view. And they're, they go across party lines. I mean, Democrat and red and blue states. They, they don't have caps. Or, you know, New York's caps, like $44,000. How they got that number, I don't know. Like, at that point, just set up a direct deposit and funnel the money. Right. And as long as we have access, as the citizenry have access to the numbers and from whom, and that is out there, I don't have a problem with it. If you take a bunch of money in Georgia from the folks that own the Hard Rock Casino, well, we know where you're going to vote on the casino bill. Right. Right. Like, like I said, if, if they want to show us who they are, let them. It's cliche at this point. And I know it's a most things, but yeah, essentially politicians should wear uh, suits like NASCAR cars, I guess, race cars with the stickers of all the people that contributed. As long as we know, I, I'm fine with it. And the fact is, some of the groups that I support... You know, whether it's Georgia Carey or somebody like that, and I see that endorsement on him, and I see they gave him money. So, okay, yeah, he, he must be, you know, good on that subject. I would like to see a more frequent um, reporting. I mean, with technology the way that it is, I don't feel like we should have to go quarterly or wait Um, twice a year when it's not an election year. I think that's a little bit, like, I would like to know what they're doing a little bit more. I feel like they could update it monthly, but that... I mean, mean, how? You've got to have a full staff of people with adding machines 
and handwriting documents in order to hand over to somebody else to transcribe, and then they, they send it by telegraph over to the newspaper men, and they take that information and they put it in their stories, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's a very complicated sure. process. That's true. <laughs> but if I, if I want to go apply for a business loan tomorrow, I call my accountant and say, can you get my financials for me? And I hand a packet over. You're right. The technology at this point is so makes information flow so easily that there is no reason that there's a reporting period. I should be able to go, ah, oh, let's be ridiculous and say, if it's not in real time that month. And if nothing happened, you just say nothing happened. Right. Because there are a lot of, especially like state reps and things like that, that there nothing happens and they can't collect any money anyway first three months of the year. Well, and there's state reps who refuse to accept money from anyone but an individual or even a constituent. Like they have to live in there. Like some of them set those boundaries for themselves. So of course they're going to make less, but I just, right. Well, that's fine. I just, it's disappointing. But, right. but we know, and they're, they're willing to tell us, is all my money's grassroots. Or your employer really likes me because I'm going to help your employer out and you'll make more money. Oh, okay, cool. Whatever it is, at least it's out in the open. I can make an informed decision as a voter. Ooh, that's a foreign concept. <laughs> An informed electorate. The horror. We can't have that. The horror. I think we could probably wrap up our matless episode. Matless. matless. Why don't you go with your closing thought? My closing thought. Last week, Joe Biden entered the race. Yes. You smell nice, Joe Biden. Entered the race, and he is probably the most reasonable of the Democrats. I mean, as far as being a centrist and old school politician, and they will destroy him. I totally agree that he is the least radical that we have up there for the Democrats. I mean, everyone who's running is a socialist progressive who just wants to spend and hand out money and... It's hor- It's terrifying. Like, and this coming from someone who's not even like a vocal. I, I didn't vote for Trump the first time. Uh, it's. I'm. I'm very concerned. I'm actually thinking about announcing my run for White House on the Democratic ticket for 2020. At this point, the odds are just getting to a coin right. flip. Well, if I, I may. Mean, they're, they're, with 20 if people. I may make a recommendation, yeah. if you're going to announce, just make sure that you announce that you're going to announce so people know ahead of time that you're planning to announce. That seems to be the trend. So you have to make an announcement of when you plan to announce. So political floor yes. uh, foreplay. I can't even pronounce it, let alone do it. Yeah, you've got to, you got to tease a little bit. Yeah, I'm thinking about it and think about it for a while and then announce. But look, I, I, one out of twenty with the like nineteen of them splitting the the uh, uh, communist vote. I, I got a chance. Did I go up against Trump? Lose? Write a book? Make a few million? Just remember us. Oh please, you're the media professional. No, here. but I do have. A friend made me like a good housekeeping stamp of approval for journalism. Oh, I saw hilarious. it. I will share it on the Facebook page. It's it's legit. It's it's quality work. You do need a T-shirt with that made on it. I know. I mean, you need everything with that made on it. Like like a the old school. You don't have a frame of reference for this. ABC Sports like with had a, a medallion on the on the breast pocket of the jacket. It is have that as you go into the meetings that you're that you're an accredited journalist. Yes. Good. And it's like we'll offer a refund if you've been offended, which obviously is not my policy, but um my work <laughs> is free. So um you don't get a refund, but yes, we'll share that. It's it's a funny little graphic. If we had a let me tell you why you're wrong store, there would be merchandise with it on it. It's that good. So that's my closing thought. 
Yes. That's your closing thought. Uh, well, Matt Lowe loves yes. public oh, land. Oh, and these are our opinions, not those of all in Georgia. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'd <laughs> get us in trouble. And please, if you like us, give us the maximum amount of stars on whatever platform you listen to us on. Share and like us on social media. I think mostly Facebook, because that's all I do, because I'm old. The end. <laughs> the end. So, for the suspended Matt Lowe, Jessica Salaji, I'm Dave Roberts. Have a great week. Bye.